Today is the last day in the quarter, it's the last day in our series of uh, Change Lives, Change Lives. And we're starting a brand new series next week and I'm still working furiously getting the preaching plan uh, out and sorted. Um, but um, it's, the new series is called Walking in the Footsteps of Jesus. Walking in the Footsteps of Jesus. And so today's sermon is going to um, tie off the Change Lives, Change Lives and introduce a little bit of the new series, Walking in the Footsteps of Jesus. As we walk in the footsteps of Jesus over the next uh, quarter, it's my prayer as uh, your lead pastor that um, you will find in the footsteps of Jesus that he was reaching teaching and caring all the time in the big moments there were ordinary moments that were big because Jesus footprints were there so uh, I'm excited by it there'll be new slides next week uh, with that um, and look forward to the brand new series walking with Jesus uh, sorry walking in the footsteps of Jesus as a way of um, bridging now between that I have today's sermon, uh, which is, I've titled it, Jesus' Culture on Repeat. Jesus' Culture on Repeat. What was his culture and what does it, what on repeat mean? Well, that'll come out as we go through. The big idea, in case you want to go to sleep this morning in my sermon, the big idea is this before you go to sleep. When we serve from our identity, we are both blessed and a blessing and the kingdom of God is advanced. When we serve from our identity, we are both blessed and a blessing and the kingdom of God is advanced. How does God see everyone? who has placed their trust in Jesus. How does God see everyone who has placed their trust in Jesus? I want to just um, share two texts here as I launch into the sermon. One is Colossians 2 verse 9. New Testament, Colossians 2 and verse 9. Colossians 2 verse 9. For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells entirely within Christ. Hold that thought. Hold that verse. Jeremiah 1 verse 5 is our second verse and then I'll launch into the sermon. Jeremiah 1 verse 5. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Old Testament... One and verse five. The word of the Lord came to me. I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. My thoughts are, do you believe these two verses that are in the Bible? Do you believe these two verses I have just read? Because many times as a church member as ch in our church life, we slip away from this reality of who we are in Jesus Christ. I'm taking uh, six or seven points from uh, these two passages right now. I want to just um, go through them for you. And if you want to refer back to those two verses to see they're there, then please do. But... Um, we find that um, how does God see those who have placed their trust in Jesus? It's important for you and I to know that, how God sees us. Because today, 
as I pastor the church, in, I've been a pastor for 32, 32 years, and I have never seen it so rough as, as it is now to pastor a church and to be God's people. I'm not talking Swan Valley Church. You guys are brill. I'm talking church-wide, what I'm seeing uh, division-wide, worldwide, in God's church. You see, all around us, there is some bad theology out there that is telling you and I that we need to make a checklist in order to find ourselves valuable before God. I won't go any deeper than that, but I think you get, get what I mean. There also is theology out there that my uh, Christian experience has to be based on knowledge. And these, this bad theology will try and tell you you have to have all the end time events all lined up. It will tell you that you have to have a list of, of works, 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 works. And if you don't think it's out there, on my phone last night, just as I was coming into Sabbath, a text comes up. I hope God finds you faithful, Pastor. And that you are living the life. I'm thinking, where is this all coming from? If I open my Bible, I find that my relationship with Christ is based on experience. Not necessarily knowledge. Not necessarily lists. You see, when I look at the Bible... The Bible tells me that I am a son and a daughter of the Most High God. I'm adopted. I have a right and I have faith in Jesus. I am his son as I stand here this morning. You are his son, his daughter as you participate in church this morning. That's who you are, firstly. Secondly, who are you? You and I are accepted by God for who we are. He accepts you just how you are. And that is the most important thing. We need to remember that we are all works in progress. We're all works in progress, accepted at all times by a God who loves us. When I buy a... um, a basketball hoop for my sons. I first set it at six foot. And they get used to potting the shots in that and they get used to it. Then we raise it to eight foot after a year or two after they're used to it. And they still, they, they learn how to rate, put the ball in at a new level and they learn that and they, they, they love their basketball hoop. And then I go to the ten foot standard height and they raise to that. At the six foot, eight foot, ten foot, were they bad at six foot? It's the same with our relationship with Jesus Christ. We're accepted by him no matter who we are, where we are on that scale. Thirdly, this means that whatever life throws at us, good or bad, we are secure because of Christ. Whatever life throws at us, good or bad, we are secure because of Christ. And if you're worried about that, you read some of those lines in those beautiful songs that uh, the worship team chose this morning. Good theology. Fourthly, We were foreknown. Jeremiah tells us that God knew us in our mum's womb. God had plans for you right there and there. Therefore, there are no surprises with God because he already knows. Fifthly, we are a chosen people, a holy nation, God's possession. Get that around your mind. Or your mind around that. We're a chosen people, a holy nation, God's special people. Sixthly, who are we? We're a temple of the Holy Spirit, if you ask Paul the Apostle. 
We are a temple of the Holy Spirit. That means that everything I do and be is worship. Not just my Sabbath morning sitting here singing songs. Everything about my life is worship back to God. We are his temple. Seventhly, seventh, we are lavished in the Father's love because we are his children. I look up the word lavish, it means we're wrapped up in his Father's love, one of the thoughts that came out. We are clothed with Christ, which means Christ gives us our identity. Christ gives us our identity. We're clothed with Christ. And yet we find in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, the first thing they knew was they were unclothed, they were naked, and they sewed leaves together. As a child of Christ, I'm clothed with Jesus Christ. I put on Jesus Christ. Okay, with those eight points in mind, that is our identity. That's who you are. That's who I am. That is how God sees you and I. And you might say, hey, Lauren, I'm not that. As I said last week, God does not see us having arrived. He calls us saints. He calls us saints right now. He calls us by what we are becoming He called his church saints. He calls his people saints. He calls us child of God. And that makes a difference in how you and I live. We can have confidence. We can have assurance. There's no maybe, ifs, and could be's. We are all children of God. That's our identity. Now, with that in mind, come with me to uh, John 13. John chapter 13. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John Chapter 13, you're going to say, ah, we know that chapter. What's that got to do with this? Well, I think it's got a lot. Let's have a look. Verse 1, before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart the world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, He loved them to the end. Now, when it was time for the supper, the the devil had already put into the heart of Judas, Simon's Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God and that he was going back to God. So he got up from the supper and laid aside the outer clothes and took the towel. Notice here, Jesus knew exactly who he was. He knew his identity. It says it here. He knew um, that his time in the world was coming to a close. He knew that uh, he had to go back to the Father, so he knew who he belonged to. And then in verse um, 4, 5, there you've got Jesus knew that his father had given everything into his hands and he had come from God and he was going back to God. Jesus knew who he was and what he was and where he got his identity from. Let's keep reading. Next, he poured the water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with water the towel tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who asked him, Lord, who are you going to, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, what I'm doing, you don't realise now, but afterwards you'll understand. You'll never wash my feet, Peter said. If I don't, Jesus replied, if I don't wash, your, wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but my hands and my head. One who has bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, 
but he is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you, for he knew what, who would betray him, and this is why he said, not all of you are clean. When Jesus had washed their feet and put on their outer clothes, his outer clothing, he reclined again and said to them, do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're speaking rightly, since that's what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet, for I've given you an example that you should do just as I've done for you. Let's leave it there. I've got a few thoughts to, uh, to draw out. Jesus knew the authority given to him. He knew his identity. He knew who he was. So what did he do? He got up from the table and took the towel. This whole transaction took place because Jesus knew who he was. He took the towel because he knew who he was. The act of service is done from a position of authority and power and strength. He was secure in his identity that he moved seamlessly from authority and teacher to servant and back to teacher again because he knew who he was. Here's my point. It's not his task that drives Jesus' identity. It's the identity that drives his task. It's not the task that drives Jesus' identity. It's his identity that drives his task. And we must copy this as his disciples. You see, our culture is so task orientated. The world tells us that our identity is found in what we do. And we are never satisfied. There is always better, always better holidays, always a better promotion, always better things. And we hunger for more. Jesus wants his disciples here at this momentous occasion, before the, the Passover, before the communion service, Jesus wanted his disciples to know that they and he wants us to know as well, that when you live in your identity, you have the power to serve. When you live in your identity... You have the power to, to serve. We, as children of God, can do things that the world does not understand. We can also do things that's beneath us because our worth is found in who we're called to be, not what we do. Sometimes we serve God in the church because we think it's a duty. Other times we do it because we have been asked. And that's all very good. But real service comes from people who follow Jesus and take the towel just as Jesus did, who step into serving because they know that their identity doesn't come from the fact that they are the carpet cleaner, but their identity comes from the fact that they're a child of God first, and therefore they'll clean the carpet. And in serving in God's church... We have all the tools we need. So we can't say, hey, I don't know. I'm not trained. I can't do this. You see, serving God is about rolling up your sleeves and doing and seeing whatever God puts under your nose. God doesn't care about what you don't have. 
God cares about what you do. So this morning, as you see, Talissa putting up some of the uh, evangelism ideas. As you see, Stormco explaining what they're doing. As you're touched on the shoulder by some of our six key leaders to serve in God's church this coming year, God doesn't care about what you do. God cares that you do what he asks. There's a little boy's lunch. Strange. Strange story. You see, the crowd's run out of, out of food. There's 5,000 need to be fed. And the 5,000 are fed because the little boy chose to serve God to serve Jesus that day by giving up his lunch. Jesus multiplied what the boy had, not what he didn't have. Jesus multiplied what the boy had, not what he didn't have. And you may think, oh, I'm only a new member. Oh, I'm getting old. Oh, I'm getting tired. Oh, And you might have all these various reasons and excuses as good as they might seem. But God's saying, hey, child of mine, just give me what you have. Just give me what you have. That's where I want to work. And so as we as a church move from a a roster basis type of thing to a nominated type basis to teams and people serving where they can. What God is saying to us as a church at Swan Valley is, I want Swan Valley to now serve with what they have and don't think about what they don't have. Serve right where you are. We find here in this passage, Jesus asks the disciples, do you understand what I've done? Do you understand what I've done, he says to his 12 disciples. And this is not a call now from Jesus to live a life of repeated foot washing. If you think that that's what's here in this story, you're missing the point totally. If you you love Jesus and are not involved in service, this is a challenge for you. Because Jesus said, my identity is with with the Father. I know who I am. I know who I am. Therefore, I'll take the towel and move, move to a servant position. And he calls you and I to to do the same. Not because of duty. Not because of guilt. But because we are privileged as a part of the family of God. You see, heaven is all about service. That's why heaven came down to you and I. Three points, if you're not getting the gist of things. One, service places you and I right in the footsteps of Jesus. When you serve in God's church... When you serve in the community, and to me there's no barriers, there's no walls between here and God's people in the community. When you serve God, you're putting yourself right in the footsteps of Jesus. Secondly, I serve Jesus because it draws me closer to him, because I'm where he is at. Jesus' whole life, if you look in the Gospels, and we're going to discover it in the coming few weeks, he was a servant of servants. He lived to serve. And the greatest act of service ever this world's ever seen was done by him on the cross of Calvary. Thirdly, serving brings us into a sense of his presence. Serving brings us into a sense of his presence. Serving God in the church, in the community, puts you right into his footsteps. 
puts you close to him and puts you in his presence. There are many opportunities for you and I to serve in God's church today. We have our six key leaders and they're there to guide you and um, so you won't get thrown into the deep end. They're there to take your questions so you'll have no difficulties. They're there to give you job descriptions. And so these six key leaders, their names are on the nose board out there, you have an opportunity to go to them and say, hey, I feel like I want to serve God. I think my gift is in worship. And so, David, I'm coming to see you to see if there's an area in um, the worship that I might be fitted for. You see, the tables are turned. No longer does the pastor, the elders, the church board, the, um, the nominating committee come to ask you. The power's gone back to the church and you say, God, I love you. It's a privilege to be a part of you. I want to walk in your footsteps, Jesus. You now think, God, where can I best serve you? And there are avenues all the way through. And so you might go and say, David, let's talk. And you talk and you find that you're a gifted trumpet player and David puts you in the call to worship part or whatever. But that's the picture of God's church now as I read it from the instructions given to me by two board meetings and two business meetings and two nominating committee meetings. Where are there gaps? There are gaps in the children's ministries where you might like to serve. You might say, oh, Lauren, I'd rather come and sit in a Sabbath school class, not do that. Don't forget the footsteps of Jesus. If he took a towel, if he took a towel, can't you be a blessing to his children? If he took a towel, can't you be a blessing for his children? Even if it's just a children's story one day out there. Our children's leaders need you. Our adventurers need you. Our pathfinders need you to get beside them and serve them. Other opportunities. Outreach. You see what Tulsa's put up? There are so many opportunities. The big freeze. I'm looking forward to that one. She mentioned that one, but I'm looking forward to that one. And I would like to see the hall full of all of you involved. And Glenn first jumping into a tub of ice water. I know. Um, now, if you want to know about the big freeze, see an elder or Talissa. Um, friendship club. You might think, oh, that's just a club for those who meet during the week and I don't see them and they don't do... It's a very, very important ministry. And there are ways that they can be served. There's people you can phone up and visit. There's people that you can... Uh, things that you can do to help make uh, Carrie and Shirley's ministry a lot lighter. Talk to, talk to um, Carrie and Shirley today about the Friendship Club. Prisons ministry. I learned so much the other night from uh, what Rhonda and Jeff are doing. And I want to challenge you, if you want to join that ministry and visit people who are stuck in um, prison that um, have a ho-hum, ho-hum life that need to be served by children of God, talk to uh, Jeff and Rhonda uh, about how you can serve in prison ministry. You might want to bake a dish for middle of meals and put a, um, a note on it and then put it in the freezer and we'll find it from there. You might want to um, take on the role of bulletin editor. We're looking for one. And if you'd like to, just see Rick. But um, the gardens around here, they don't just grow because we have an automatic sprinkler system on them. They need tender care, need love. And you might want to say, hey, I can help support our deacons. I can help support Andrew. Talk to Andrew. Um, if you would come in here on a Thursday morning, don't come in the front door because you'll find nothing. If you came in the back door through the kitchen... You take one step in that door and you'll find a hive of activity as Ethel so lovingly leads that group and they, um, they uh, make uh, meals, they cook, they make soups and, and, of course, they have a bit of yak, yak, yak in the meantime, but they cook, 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 the yak, 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 cook, cook, cook and we get beautiful food. 
be a part of that group. It's a great group. I get the privilege of seeing it because I come and bring supplies into it and usually I'm in a hurry, but they slow me down as I chat to them and talk and I feel blessed. Great group, great group, see Ethel. Um, And I've already mentioned the worship team and uh, David's waiting for you. These are only some roles. Then when you take out and go out to the windows into the world, there are so many opportunities out there in the community. It's the same. Serving in the church, out the church, it's the same. Jesus took the barrier down at the cross and said the place for the church is in the world. It's the same. Another sermon, another sermon, another time. When we serve from our identity, we are blessed and a blessing and the kingdom of God is advanced. No wonder the devil's trying to bring that bad theology into our church. He wants to stop the church up. He wants to stop us from doing our most important calling, being servants of the Most High God. If you haven't got my sermon yet, if you haven't got my sermon and my, and my drift and my point yet, bear with me for one more point. A young ministerial student was uh, at doing his ministerial degree through university. He was also pastoring a church at the same time. And he was just a ministerial student completing his studies. On one occasion, Sean, his name was, and he was in Ireland, Sean, his name was, realised and heard, or have heard word that someone in his parish was hungry because of a bureaucratic foul-up and it left a mother with five kids who had no food and no hope of getting any until the end of the month. Although the family was not a part of his church, Sean went to the shops and bought a supply of groceries that filled three boxes. He went to the apartment where this young mum and her her, uh, five kids was living and he took up the boxes one by one up four flights of stairs. Then he went to the door and rung the bell. And a little boy, about seven years old, answered the doorbell. And um, he opened the door and looked up into the eyes of the minister and then looked down and saw all the groceries there beside the minister's feet. And he screamed at his mother, Mama, Mama, come quick. Jesus has just bought us some food. Jesus has just bought us some food. In telling the instant later, this pastor, Sean, said, I will never forget that child's comment. At that moment, I realised I was Christ for the hungry child. God has no barriers. Whether you serve a hungry child out in the community or you serve someone in the church as a deacon or as a, on the worship, in the friendship club, in the kitchen, wherever you're serving God's church, and there's many, many more, you're serving Jesus Christ. Just as vivid as that little boy saw in the pastor, Jesus Christ. God has no barriers only that his church become his servants. It's the same when we serve in the church. No matter what we do, we are Jesus to those that we serve. When we serve from our identity, we are both blessed and a blessing and the kingdom of God is advanced.